The following podcast may be disturbing to those who support hatred, terrorism, anti-Semitism, and discrimination. Viewer discretion is advised. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Arsene Ostrovsky uh, from the International Legal Forum. Welcome to this latest exciting episode of How We Fought Against Podcast. Our guest today is the amazing Olga Deutsch from NGI Monitor. I will introduce her very, very shortly. Uh, tonight we have a, a very special episode. Um, many of you may have heard in the news in the last uh, in the last days, breaking news that Israel designated six Palestinian NGOs uh, over uh, their connection to the PFLP. Palestinian terror group, uh, so that has uh, gained a lot of uh, a lot of attention um, in the news, a lot of uh, debate about who they are, what happened, and how it uh, how it affects um, how it affects things moving forward uh, in terms of funding of uh, terror, in terms of incitement. Um, we have no better expert than Olga here to talk to us. Olga is the vice president of NGO Monitor, really one of the leading um, applied research institutes um, in Israel, um, as the name might indicate, uh, they monitor NGOs to make sure that they are transparent, to make sure that they are um, following their own uh, mandates, that their money is not going towards purposes of terror, towards purposes of, uh, of incitement, and they play a really instrumental role also in uh, this uh, in this designation. It, took, it didn't happen overnight, it's something that took a lot of effort over many years. Uh, I'll go and you guys were intimately involved in that. Just a uh, way of a little bit of uh, background, Olga brings extensive experience in international politics. Uh, she has a particular emphasis on Europe and Israel relations. This will have a special impact in terms of uh, funding from uh, the EU and from Europe that goes towards Palestinian and NGOs. Uh, she's worked with elected officials um, around the world. She's been active, really not just active, but a leader in fighting anti-Semitism and fighting um, in fighting boycotts and all the organization movement um, against uh, against Israel. Um, she's originally from Serbia. She speaks how many languages? Four. Four, that's, <laughs> that's okay. And above all else, she is not only a dear colleague and partner of the uh, International Legal Forum, but most and uh, foremost, uh, a dear friend. Um, welcome. So it's, it's great to have you here. Well, thank you, Arsene, after an introduction like this, I, I have to collect myself first, but it is an utmost pleasure to join you. Uh, the podcast that you guys here have been doing is uh, always revealing on the spot in terms of most uh, trending topics, and uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to have you. All right, let's get straight to business. Um, I feel like, you know, there's been a lot of misinformation in terms of what's going on. Uh, people are... Uh, People are reading it, people are watching it in the news, perhaps don't quite fully understand what these organizations are. One would think that seeing some of the reports and some of the, act, some of the reactions, these organizations have been involved in some most hideous forms of terror. One would think, given the responses we're seeing online um, or in the news, that these are some kind of uh, you know, civil society organizations or soup kitchens doing you know, honorable things. Um, Give us first perhaps a little bit of background. What are these six organizations that were just designated and perhaps why? So it's an excellent question. Um, look, let's first things put, on, uh, put things on the table. This is not only a security event, right? The Ministry of Defense, the Israeli Ministry of Defense designated six uh, NGOs this last Friday. Uh, and a couple of years ago, the seventh mm -hmm. organization. So now we have seven NGOs that are affiliated to PFLP that are designated as terror, which makes it a full-blown network, right? Mm -hmm. We call it the PFLP NGO network. Um, just like any society, the Palestinian society has a civil society, which is a handful of non-governmental organizations that are supposed to basically hold the Palestinian Authority accountable, right? They're supposed to call them out mm -hmm. when they uh, are not promoting human rights or not necessarily dealing with... Uh, uh, with the important issues. So amongst these seven groups, you will find a group that deals only with infrastructure and agricultural mm -hmm. uh, projects. You'll find a group that deals with children and their rights. You'll find a group that deals with women's rights. Uh, you'll find a group like Adamir that deals with prisoners' mm -hmm. rights and their access to basic uh, 
uh, you know, services and rights and so on. So seemingly, it is just like in other, any other country, mm-hmm. a network of human rights and humanitarian NGOs. But PFLP, which is uh, the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine, uh, an organization that is both a political party in the PA, it's important to mention that, but it's also a terrorist organization designated as such by Israel, obviously, but also US, Canada, and the EU. Uh, a few years back... It's important to stress because people, I don't think, quite fully appreciate the fact that there is an internationally recognized terror, terror. including by the EU and the US, and those groups that do ultimately provide money that ends up uh, in the hands. Correct. So they identified a few mm-hmm. years back basically an opportunity mm-hmm. to create an NGO network that gives them both access to governmental funding, mm-hmm. but more importantly, we always focus on the on the money, right, on the funding, and, 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 and it is also important since 2011, our research shows that over $250 million has been transferred by the EU and European governments to eight PFLP-connected NGOs. That's just, if you pause for a second, that's a lot of money. But money is, to my mind, almost secondary. The much Mm -hmm. uh, more dangerous uh, thing is the platform that they are being given, access to decision makers, access uh, to to get a seat around a table in the parliaments around Europe and the world, where their reports are being quoted and used as references to draw policies and, uh, you know, legislate and decide how the EU and other uh, European governments will um, engage in the Middle East. So they, they, uh, so PFLP figured out that it's an ama- awesome, amazing vehicle to promote, uh, at best, anti-Israel mm-hmm. warfare, right? Because uh, a group like Al-Haq, which is amongst the designated ones, mm-hmm. was the main signatory behind the... Uh, complaint against Israel at the International Criminal Court in The Hague, mm-hmm. and at worst, terror activities, um, and I, I assume I will be talking a little bit more about that um, uh, today, um, because some of these groups were directly involved with the murder of Rina Schnurr mm-hmm. uh, two years ago um, in a terror attack. So, mm-hmm. so it's a very uh, coordinated, or- mm-hmm. orchestrated operation, Ran so, by PFLP. So have they essentially, I mean, did PFLP essentially establish these NGOs as a front? Or did a, did it something, is it something that transpired over a natural course? So these organizations, for example, which developed in their own right, ultimately saw PFLP as a, as a means for, uh, for greater funding and the ability to uh, facilitate and carry out their activities. Well, I think uh, things happen much more organically. Uh, once, after the peace accords, right, the, the Europe, specifically the European governments mm-hmm. wanted to support creation of uh, democracy and sustainable society uh, mm-hmm. on the Palestinian side. And this is something that typically the European, this is the way that the Europeans uh, uh, do it. So they uh, do that both by supporting directly the PA mm-hmm. and its institutions, but also by assisting the Palestinians in building a thriving civil society. But if you think, who are usually the first ones to get the memo, (laughs) to hear about this, and who are the first ones to interact Mm -hmm. with Europeans, it's those that are already involved in the political discourse. So going back to to the fact that PFLP is a political party, Mm -hmm. I think that they just identified an opportunity, and then the rest is, uh, we see the results of the rest now. Is there any reason um, this transpired now? I mean, we've known for a long time these connections. Uh, we've seen um, you know, the connections between NGOs, between the terror groups, this trail of money from uh, capitals in Europe ultimately going to Gaza, to Ramallah, uh, for the purpose of uh, those groups carrying out uh, activities of incitement and terror against us. But is there any reason that uh, this particular designation perhaps uh, came about at this point in time? I do, I do think that there is. Um, for we at NGO Monitor have been following these groups for over a decade, and we have seen uh, t- clear connections between uh, the leadership of PFLP and the senior officials of these NGOs. But every time we would raise the uh, concerns with the European donor governments, uh, we would uh, be met with 
uh, statements like this is circumstantial, it's, it's not enough uh, evidence, there's mm -hmm. no proof that they are an actual or an active terror organization, and so on, or that they pose a threat. We know for a fact that uh, in Europe, uh, the security uh, establishment and the ministries of interior of most countries are fully aware of PFLP being active it's in Europe. It's fascinating that the, I think the security apparatuses in Europe and around the world, they, they, they understand that very well, but the, the political echelon, there's this dichotomy that perhaps there's a, um, well, a bit of a reluctance. Well, yes and no. A few years ago, uh, the Ministry of uh, Interior in Germany, mm -hmm. in their annual assessment, which is made public of threats, you know, facing the uh, German uh, society internally, they they said that PFLP is an active organization in the within the borders of Germany, but does not pose a threat to German citizens. So, um, but I do think that the the terror attack in which uh, Rina Schnur, a 17 years old girl, was murdered in August 2019, uh, was a milestone. I mean, tragically for her and her family, obviously, uh, and for the, the entire uh, people of Israel. Um, it did change the paradigm surrounding PFOP because it did um, sort of bring back PFOP as an actual terror organization that commits uh, terror attacks which kill civilians. And uh, a couple of months later, in December 2019, Israeli media reported that the, the Israeli security services uh, arrested a PFOP network of 50 um, at least five of those 50 were senior officials, so CEO and uh, financial directors of at least three of the NGOs that we are discussing today. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, we are speaking here in, uh, to the legal community, so uh, it goes without saying that from that moment until a full-blown designation, it's a very lengthy and complex legal uh, proceeding. And uh, this designation should not be taken lightly, exactly because mm. it has taken two years to the Ministry of uh, Justice in Israel, based on the work of the Ministry of Defense and uh, Security Forces. Mm. Now, I know, um, I mean, so you're making some point, right? this, this has taken some time, obviously, to gather, to gather the evidence, to, to connect the, the dots, and it's a very complicated uh, global um, map. Um, uh, many organizations involved, we certainly have an aspect of it, but you guys really led the way in so many ways with the work and research you conducted at NGO Monitor. Maybe you can just share with us, you know, as much as you can, a little bit about some of the efforts uh, that you undertook to sort of to really to uh, connect the, the pieces. So, look, we operate, and this is the, um, I think, the, the, the most interesting part. We only look at the publicly available information. Mm -hmm. We don't have any... Uh, uh, intelligence capacities of collecting mm. confidential or classified information. Uh, and over the years we have document, co documented pages and pages of, uh, of clear proof that uh, senior officials of these groups are directly linked uh, to PFOP. Mm. So we have taken it as our um, you know, task, as our job to alert decision makers mm -hmm. across the world, first and foremost the uh, European uh, officials because uh, most of the funding to these groups comes from the EU and the uh, other European governments, but also the Israeli officials. We uh, definitely called for uh, a public discussion on this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We were happy to provide that and, um, and we were glad to see that in the last uh, two years um, that public discussion did get a lot of members of the parliament and members of the European mm -hmm. Parliament to going on a very, um, uh, very um, active campaign, calling for their respective administrations to look into this. The EU opened an investigation. The Dutch government mm -hmm. froze funding to uh, one of these groups and opened an, investi an official investigation into potential diversion of funds through to terror through NGOs. And uh, over the summer. The EU's age, um, money laundry and anti-fraud agency, OLAF, also opened the preliminary investigation. So there was a series of, of events also on the European donor government side um, that are preliminary but point to uh, very suspicious uh, trends. So uh, again, we are ha part of the argument that we always bring to the table is that our reports are based on open source information, mm -hmm. meaning everyone, including donor governments, 
could, should be able to, to check and Google mm -hmm. and do uh, better vetting when they decide who they want to work with. Okay. Let me ask you in terms of uh, practically, what does it mean next? How, how, what are the practical implications of this designation? How will it affect the flow of funds? Will it, uh, will it uh, impair or hamper the ability of these organizations to fundraise, to commit acts of terror? Practically speaking, you know, what happens next? So it's important to understand also what the designation in legal term mm -hmm. means. In legal terms, it means it gives the Israeli establishment um, legal grounds mm -hmm. to shut down the, the, the organizations or uh, try to prevent funding to them, but it, it, it is not an automatic proceeding. Mm -hmm. It just gives them the legal grounds. I think um, the important um, next step will be direct uh, bilateral uh, discussions mm -hmm. uh, uh, surrounding these issues with the donor governments. And that includes EU and other uh, European member states. Mm -hmm. There is extensive Spanish funding to these groups. Um, we said Dutch, the EU, uh, some German indirect so the funding. The EU has a block, the biggest, uh, biggest donor? The EU is, in general, the single largest donor mm -hmm. when it comes to aid and mm -hmm. obviously uh, funding to NGOs in the world. So mm -hmm. that is uh, relevant also in our uh, niche when it comes to the uh, to Israeli or Palestinian groups or other NGOs uh, that engage they engage in the context of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Mm -hmm. But this will also include uh, discussions with Canadians because there's also some Canadian funding to some mm -hmm. of these groups. And most certainly, and uh, this is a novelty perhaps uh, given the previous U.S. administration, there will be talks uh, with D.C. Uh, the new U.S. administration is about to administer uh, over 250 million U.S. dollars to Palestinian people-to-people -people projects. That in colloquial terms means uh, uh, that a lot of it will be uh, done with or through NGOs. And it would be important to, as opposed to what we... Uh, mm -hmm. need to discuss in Europe, which is retroactive yeah. uh, uh, investigations, that in the U.S. they look ahead of time and make sure that none of this money, by coincidence, ends, in, ends up in wrong hands. Okay. There's been also, I mean, I know you're tracking a lot of the, the, the responses to this designation, and that includes from, uh, uh, from uh, multilateral bodies, from uh, diplomatic, uh, from capitals, and um, from the media, people in the street. Um, I saw, for example, just uh, the other day, the, Michelle Bichel, the, the head of the UN Human Rights Organization, um, or the head of the UN Human Rights Body, essentially saying it's a breach of the fundamental human rights of these organizations and Palestinian people, which makes me think, is it really, according to the UN, a human right, a human right of these organizations to commit acts of terror against Jews, against Israel? So it seems like there's certainly been a lot of uh, a lot of pushback uh, from uh, uh, from the media, from uh, the NGO network, so to speak, and diplomats. Um, how do we respond to that? I mean, how do we what what do we say to that when we when we see articles saying that this is um, you know encroachment of Palestinian civil rights or free speech? Uh, how do we what do we say? Well. Um... It's, it's an excellent question, and it's, a, it's an excellent showcase of how almost nothing that happens in our region uh, does not become political. <laughs> Everything here is uh, not only political, but gets politicized. So, it, first of all, it doesn't come as a surprise that the left-leaning uh, parts of the Israeli coalition government are um, very critical of the designation. Uh, and that includes all the uh, the NGOs that are critical of the Israeli uh, policies, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because these are the groups that cooperate with the designated Palestinian organizations on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question, one, you know, the question begs itself. So what, what does it make them? Are they friends of mm -hmm. terrorists in in theory? Uh, and it's and, and I'd like to take a, a moment and acknowledge how dramatic the designation is. Having said that. The right question is not if this is ramping down human rights. The right question is, can it be that human rights organizations or human rights as a term have been hijacked and abused by terrorists? Um, I think that um, if we 
draw a parallel example. Uh, we said, for example, that CIA or Europol uh, went public and said that they unearthed um, an NGO network that uh, uh, disguised itself as human rights groups, but in practice are connected to Daesh mm -hmm. or Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we would be seeing a similar reaction from uh, uh, across the political spe spectrum demanding uh, proof. We don't usually demand proof from our security apparatuses around mm -hmm. the world. We trust them that the information was collected and that obviously part of the information cannot be shared with the public because it's classified. Mm -hmm. um, but again, bringing it back to, um, to what we do at NGO Monitor, the, the pages and pages of the proof that we have been collecting over the years should have been enough mm -hmm. to, um, to get the donor governments to at least ask the right questions. Meaning, it's not even that they should stop working with these groups because they are bona fide terrorists. Mm -hmm. They should have stopped working with these groups because are, there's any link between mm -hmm. their leaders and a terrorist organization. And when uh, reports of the, the terror attack hit the media in late 2019, that should have been the final moment where all mm -hmm. of them should have stopped, froze, and investigated. It is, it is almost mind-blowing to me that... Um, decision makers anywhere in the world would say, well, you know, someone might be connected to terror, but I'm going to continue working with them and allowing them to do some of the most sensitive work, which is providing human, you know, humanitarian aid and protecting human rights in a conflict-ridden area uh, to people who might be connected to anything violent or terror-related. Uh, so... So I think that's uh, endemic of this uh, consistent, let's say, double standard against uh, against the state of Israel. As you said, you know, I don't think any other country in the world, uh, certainly no other democracy in the world, would be questioned in such a manner. Would be told to we need further evidence or to justify uh, any certain country to be able to be required to justify a basic. Uh, uh, a basic national security undertaking uh, such as this. Um, I wanted to ask you a last question because we're, we're running out of time. In terms of um, what we can do next, and by we I mean uh, what can lawyers do, what can uh, you know, the, the, the honourable civil society do, friends of uh, the people in the pro Israel network, whether it's in Europe, in the United States, around the world, uh, we have this information, we have this foundation where certainly uh, can be used as a springboard to actual action, to meaningful action. What would you suggest, you know, uh, some practical steps perhaps that can be taken? Well, I think, um, I strongly believe, I think that I strongly believe that the best way to address this issue is if um, uh, citizens of each of the countries that we are discussing mm -hmm. uh, demand accountability and transparency, mm -hmm. meaning NGO Monitor is an Israeli-based organization, so we can provide research, but it is a Spanish citizen and a Spanish-based organization and a German citizen um, and so on that, are, uh, that should be asking for answers from their respective governments. It is their public money, their taxpayers' money that is being um, used, right, mm -hmm. to promote very um, uh, praiseworthy causes around the world. But when there is clear evidence, or at least uh, concern, that some of that money has been abused, then I do believe that uh, some answers should be provided. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, asking parliamentary questions, mm -hmm. demanding hearings in the countries, uh, getting the members of the parliament to uh, initiate uh, discussions in their respective parliaments, getting even the ministries of justice involved, mm -hmm. right? Uh, calling for the security agencies to cooperate with the Israeli Ministry of Defense. Mm -hmm. uh, these are only some of the ideas mm -hmm. uh, that come to my mind. But in general, um, asking that taxpayers' money, uh, hard-earned money, right, is being spent in a in a simply accountable manner. Nothing more and nothing less. It's, it, it almost sounds it's, uh, simple. It's a no, no, novel, <laughs> novel concept today, but one that is uh, obviously 
tremendous thing forward. And um, Olga, thank you so much uh, to you personally and to the incredible work that Angel Monitor is doing. You guys are really, I think, at the, at the forefront in so many ways of holding these uh, NGOs to account and you're fighting for the truth and fighting against the forces that seek to uh, not only delegitimize Israel, but I think undermine the very foundations of the, of democracy. I'm uh, proud to call you guys partners and friends. Um, and keep, uh, please continue doing the amazing work uh, that you are doing. And um, we look forward to uh, more successes like this in the future. So thank you for joining us once again. Well, thank you so much, Arsen, and thank you to your entire network. Uh, it is also important to have such a platform of skilled legal experts and activists around the world. So you too keep up mm -hmm. the great work. Thank you, Olivia. And thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us for this uh, for this episode of How We Fought Against. Um, this episode will be live on our Facebook page and our YouTube page. You can also view it on uh, on Spotify, on um, Apple with a store, on Podbean, and uh, a number of other platforms. Uh, thank you once again, and please tune in for the next episode.